Hell. <laughs> All right. Um, where's Debbie? Oh, Debbie, you're in the. You're not where you usually are. All right. Um, who's who's running the Zoom? Is is Sarah running it or is N Nava? Nava's our administrator, I believe. Nava, are we ready to go? Yes, we're ready to go. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome everybody to the Rye Town Council meeting of October 20th uh, via Zoom uh, as per the governor's executive orders. Um, Debbie has the flag behind her and uh, let us all say the pledge together. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the, of the United, United States, States, States of America, America. and to the and republic, republic and which is one for God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Okay, you know what? That was a terrible show. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think in the future we're going to have to have one person recite the the pledge for all of us so that it is comes out loud and clear rather than mumbling. <laughs> all right. well, we all feel so American and patriotic right now. Well, yes. we can all put our hands over our hearts while we do it and have one loud voice speak the pledge. <clears throat> all right. All right. Um, Hope, do you want to do the roll call, please? That's Hope Vespia, not Hope Klein. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hope <laughs> Klein. Okay. All right. Councilperson Jill Axelrod. Here. Councilperson Lindsay Jackson. Here. Councilperson Pamela Jaffe. Here. Councilperson Thomas Nardi. Here. And Supervisor Gary Zuckerman. Here. Thank you. Um, okay. Our, our fight, first item of business is approving the minutes of uh, 915. Uh, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. A second. Thank you. Uh, if there are no objections or changes, I mean, uh, to the bed. I can't. Who said that? Vic is not objecting. <laughs> I uh, think Vic <laughs> has not muted himself, so you're picking up, you know, ambient right. noise in his house. <laughs> All right. Then, in that case, um, uh, do we all approve? All yes. approve. Yes. Aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, throwing my game off here. All right, our first item tonight is uh, the local law number two of 2020, which is a continued public hearing. Um, I will announce that there will be no vote tonight and the public hearing will be open, held open once again in case we need to make any further changes. Um, I would like to note uh, that there have been several changes since the original law was set forth. Number one, and possibly most importantly, is the schedule of penalties has been changed substantially so that the maximum penalty is $5,000 for not filing, and it is lowered depending on the assessed value. Um, it is now one tenth of 1% or $5,000, whichever is less. So a property of $5 million where the owner fails to file will be a $5,000 penalty. And um, that would continue for higher rated properties, higher assessed properties. The um, properties lower than that would be assessed based on the assessed value. Uh, so that a property assessed at $1 million would be assessed at $1,000. Um, which I think the property owners would be, I hope would be appreciative of. Uh, the other item right, were, were changed. One is that the uh, penalty schedule will not go into effect the first year, but in the second year. So even though it is mandatory to file an income and expense statement under the law, there will be no penalty attaching the first year. Uh, we hope that everybody would I don't want to say it's voluntary, but I would hope that the um, you know everybody would file, but there will be no penalty the first year. And the third major change is we make it very explicit, although I think it was certainly implicit that this um, that 
the income and expense statements are private. They are uh, not foilable. No member of the public or competitor can foil the income and expense statement that's held by the assessor. And I reiterate that um, disclosing uh, the information is a criminal offense. So um, with those changes, um, who would like to speak for, for the public? I see Hope, Hope Klein. Yes, I recognize you, Hope. Hope is my neighbor, by the way. So. Uh, just start and start reading, is that good enough? Pardon me, Hope, I didn't hear that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I just state who I am and read what I've prepared? Sure, and if it's in writing, I think you submitted it, did yes. You have I did. a letter submitted. I did. Okay, we, we, we have your letter. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hope Klein, um, and the business is the car wash in Port Chester. I submitted the letter for consideration for this meeting, um, being that I'm a lifelong Port Chester and Rybrook resident, and also that I have an uh, income producing property in Port Chester. I strenuously oppose the adoption of this local law. First, it raises serious concerns regarding confidentiality. I know that Gary just was talking about the proof of FOIL, but that despite the inclusion of the penalties for the disclosure of the confidential business information, or as he said, that it might be uh, an offense, uh, I think it's nigh impossible for the town to limit the dissemination of information required by the number of people that are, have access to this substantial information. Also, you're including the town, the staff, the agents of the assessor, and any other resident volunteers that serve on the board of that assessment review. In addition, I think it's unlikely that the town has the financial resources, the computer expertise to make sure that some of this data uh, couldn't be hacked. Uh, second, I feel that the law places the carriage before the horse by authorizing the town assessor to issue these rules and regulations regarding the law after the law is adopted. Based on what Gary just said, I know that they are changing things, but this post facto guidance uh, is not helpful or available. Um, and I just wanna say across the board, uh, if the article is right and there's 250 uh, commercial properties, uh, none of this information uh, has been uh, posted uh, in Spanish for those that are Spanish speaking commercial property owners. Um, the forms on which the information is placed, uh, I just have objection to the rules, to the regulations, uh, what happens when these forms are, are late and the evaluation of the um, suitability of this law should only be made, I believe, that when taxpayers know exactly what the information is, I know it's changing as we speak, what the format is and what's required. Um, I do believe, even though he's just talked about reducing these penalties, that it's exorbitant and uh, puts a tremendous amount of pressure on what business owners are left. And, and I say that because when you walk up and down the streets here, you will see that we've had many, many companies have to just completely close their doors. Um, I feel that the assessor prior to this, because of Tyler Technologies, who uh, was paid grandly, um, and I have other issues with mistakes in their algorithms, but they should have sufficient information and expertise on how to determine the fair market value of these properties without resorting to these intrusive and punitive data collections. Fourth, the introduction of this income-based method of determining the real value suggests, I think, unintentionally that somehow all of this work, all of this pain, these prior assessments were somehow inaccurate. Nobody wants to take responsibility for that. We're moving into something new without maybe saying that there's been a mistake beforehand. And if there has, why has there been? Um, 
The town is not admitting that the current assessment practices are wrong or an act, uh, uh, you know, inexact. And we also know that with all of the properties, there are many, many, many mistakes. Um, the other thing is, is that I do feel in my own opinion that uh, it's expensive. It could be potentially criminal unless the law goes through. Um, the statute is being introduced, I think, unfairly in the midst of the pandemic. And one of the things I wanted to say was uh, there's a height of insensitivity that during the time of a pandemic and in light of a second and third wave approaching that the town of Rye wants to raise taxes on the business owners because I've never seen them go down, who have really suffered terribly, both financially during this time, emotionally during this time and as a community. Many businesses are closed. They've had no income, no earnings, or they're partially closed. Many of these businesses that struggled to stay open or afloat had to, and even though there were resources for support, not all of them got them, and they were still trying to help pay employees. I, I personally do not believe that this is the right time for this discussion to be happening. There are literally hundreds of people who are unaware that this is happening. It has not been, um, even if it has been put out into the public notice, each one of these people who are commercial property uh, producing uh, owners, uh, not all of them have been directly contacted and that is definitely an issue. I feel that this is extremely insensitive of the town. It speaks volumes about what it is that they want to do and how they maybe want to protect us, but there feels like there's no protection here whatsoever. Um, and I think that there's a more uh, feasible way to do this uh, and to be able to have an open discussion without trying to, in this time, just impose this law. The town of Rye may be doing, in the long run, uh, more harm than it's doing good, and it will not necessarily, do I believe, uh, attract more people to come here and do business. Uh, and with that being said, we have some very serious issues with the Hilton closing, with Doral closing, with the almost 20 years the United Hospital has been uh, vacant. Um, so for these reasons, I respectfully request that you adopt or put this legislation uh, on the back burner until the time in which the community and the business owners have a fair opportunity to be able to value this, uh, be able to review this, uh, and that we can talk amongst ourselves and be able to have a better understanding without just having two meetings. The last one on September 15th, I only found out about the meeting about two hours prior. So that's all that I have to say. And I thank everyone for listening to me. And I appreciate having this opportunity uh, to speak to all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. I think that you were very clear. Excellent presentation. Thanks, uh, normally, I, I, I don't want to, I normally don't comment, but just two things, uh, two of the issues that you raised. Um, the, the assessor, you kind of hinted that the assessor does not use an income-based method to determine the value of real property. That's not true. Uh, the the income method is the standard method that's that's being used, um, and in fact, as as most people are aware, and I think you are too, that when you file a grievance, you must produce an income and expense statement, and if you go to court on a tax cert, you must produce an income and expense statement. Um, this is the standard methodology, so this is not new, um, and. You know, Tyler Technology, when they did the revalues, this this is a uh, this is something that all assessors have used. It is the most accurate method of assessing property, and will become more accurate when we have a an income and expense statement on a regular basis from all of the property owners. Um, I think that. You know, a lot of people, and I think you alluded also, that it is cumbersome. We're trying to make it very easy. Um, income and expense statements have to be furnished to your account when you do your taxes. We're actually going to set up an online portal 
for the easy entry of the of the information for the property owner. We don't want to make it difficult. We want to make it easy. And not only that, but in, you allude to the time of COVID, property values are going down, especially, I can't say residential value, but commercial values are going down. And furnishing an income and expense statement that shows that the value of the property has decreased will prompt the assessor to lower the value of the property, not to raise the value. Of course, that has nothing to do with taxes, which are based on the school districts and the villages more than more than the town. But um, it will be an aid in the, this kind of a time to have an income and expense statement. If you if you have a commercial building and your properties are half vacant, that will be reflected in the assessment of the year. So it's a, it becomes a benefit. So I just wanted to comment on that, Hope. And thank you for your presentation. Right. I, I, can I just say one more thing? Sure. I, I, I have literally gone from building to building, and I, I just don't understand why these people weren't contacted accordingly and why there's absolutely no collateral, uh, nothing in Spanish. And so when I go to speak mm -hmm. to someone who owns a business who's Spanish speaking and I hand them this proposed lo local law number two, uh, I, I found a Spanish version, but a lot of this, I, I just, I hope you raise a good point. I definitely think that we definitely need more time. I was very grateful that I'm you not, said. Well, you that. notice I said I said we're not closing the public hearing. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you. Okay. Yes, I appreciate that. Yes. Great. Um, thank you. I think, I think that uh, uh, reach out to Hispanic property owners would probably certainly appropriate, and um, and I think we can do that and let them know. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hope. Uh, Anybody else want to, who's, who's next on the list? Anybody want to speak to, to this matter? I know we have a lot of commercial property owners. You don't all have to speak. You can just observe and we can move on. Mr. Ravikoff, you are on my screen. How we go ahead. Can you hear me? I just unmuted myself. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Howie Ravikoff. My family has owned property in the village of Porchester for over 50 years. I appreciate all of your time and energy tonight and all throughout the year. Uh, it's a really difficult environment for everyone. That's not new information. And the fact that you are, are all here having scrambled together to make this happen in this weird format is impressive. And I am grateful. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a a lot of great information from some very reputable people um, available for everyone to read, and I trust you all have read it. I, I won't reiterate what I've written, what others have said, but I would like to add, I think it would be great for you all to commit to addressing each and every concern or question that has been presented to you in writing. I understand the gravity of this local law, you clearly do as well. Thank you for recognizing that and for already making such great adjustments uh, in your proposed law. Take that opportunity and win me over. Uh, I'm a naysayer. I, I would throw this proposal on the ground as soon as I received it, but I understand you have your reasons. I'd love to learn them. I, I'd like to hear in depth from key personnel why this is so vital and why this is so vital today because of all points in time, please don't pass this law today. We are so burdened with so many different things to have to add this to our list and the potential consequences of this to our burden, please don't pass it. But if you must continue to consider it, please do everything you can to show me that this is necessary and it's necessary today. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avakoff. Um, it is not being passed tonight. I can assure you. I, I understand. I heard you in the in the very beginning of the meeting. Thank you for being clear about it. I hope you take the opportunity you've created for yourselves to address the concerns that are being brought to your attention. Well, you know, I, I have read your letter, um, and I, I hope all of us have, and we are trying to adjust to address the various concerns. I know that it's a substantial 
uh, change for some people, but um, others file grievances every year and submit the statements. Some file grievances and don't bother to submit the statements. Um, I just want to reiterate for you, and I keep re reiterating it, is that the purpose is to get a more accurate assessment. It's not to raise money. It's not to raise anybody's assessment. It's not to lower anybody's assessment. It's to make the assessment as accurate as possible. That's the goal. I, I appreciate that goal. I'd love to hear how this particular law furthers that goal. And, and to just uh, add one additional thought, if I may, there are a lot of uh, commercial property owners that aren't present today and aren't making their thoughts uh, known, um, either in person or in writing. And I believe many of those property owners simply believe this will become law and they have no voice and no say. They take for granted that this is going to happen regardless of what uh, questions and hesitations they may have. Uh, if you marry that idea with what's happening in time today, it's a great moment for this board to say to the commercial property owners, we understand we're behind you and we listen to you. And this is the environment for you to be able to say, we're business friendly. I would love to see you take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't have, Neva, can you see the screen? Is there anybody else up? I can't hear you, Neva. You're on mute. You're on mute, Neva. Neva, you're on mute. Yes. Okay, would anyone else like to comment? Uh, Tony Serretta here. I would like to, to comment quickly. Okay. After, uh, I own the property where the Salt Air restaurant is across from Bar Taco. Was my family's plumbing supply some 45 or 50 years ago. Live on Lafayette Drive, live and work in Porchester. After listening to Howie and Hope, I agree. I'm not going to uh, be redundant and go over everything. I agree with almost everything they said. Um, I sent my letter in. I'm sure everyone's read it. My main concerns are still the confidentiality of this information and maybe the possible option of another method of sharing the information that's required as opposed to just sending it in and it being in your possession for however long or however protected maybe uh, could be reviewed uh, going back to what hope says timing is everything here with we go through uh, a reassessment uh, don't know really the result of the reassessment then covid and you know i've had i don't know where i stand with other landlords but you know the, i have a restaurant in my building which is suffering tremendously I've had two tenants go out and I've had other tenants paying their rent and doing okay. It's a real mix, but there's a total uncertainty of the future with what we're gonna plan for, for 2021, 2022. We don't know the result of the reassessment that happened and we're already working on a cure for whatever happened. I don't know the reason for it either, but I don't think with the majority of properties in Porchester, I don't think it's that difficult to really assess their value until you start getting into the larger properties and then pretty much could see your point and, and what you're trying to achieve. But I don't see the urgency with everything that's going on. Um, and then pretty much everything else was the same that we uh, spoke about. The penalties were a big issue on mine and, and I appreciate the fact you addressed the penalties. And, and I thought uh, Howie had a good idea too with, you know, I don't know how many people have submitted letters, but I didn't know about this happening until I got the Westmore News, saw it, and then started making phone calls to everybody I knew. There was no, I didn't, it could be me, I, I work a lot, but I didn't see a real effort in notification of people that this was going to happen. And uh, I think that's what led to a real scramble into getting something in for this meeting because the way I understood it is there was a vote tonight to do it. And I didn't think that was enough time for all the property owners to wrap their head around everything that's going on and how to prepare for what's coming down the road. And uh, being that you're not voting tonight, I appreciate that too. And I think 
that and then the other thing I thought is there could be uh, a system where if property was of greater value like coal shopping center something large uh, as that or the the right town property up on king street that you know that would be a standard for them but smaller properties along main street wouldn't have to do it but then i'm understanding that that can't happen even though i don't know if i agree with that but legally i understand it uh it can't happen well yeah we we were like we we're looking into the idea you know so it's been suggested, why can't you do this for properties that are valued over, let's say, $5 million or something like that? I don't know that the, the law, I've asked the, the town attorney to look into that. Um, I don't know that the law permits such classification uh, to treat a property that's worth $5.1 million different than a property that's worth $4.9 million. Right. You know what I mean? And I don't know that, that a property owner who's property is worth $3 million should um, not have as accurate an assessment as somebody who's worth $10 million. So there are those issues too. But one thing that you did bring up that I think is very interesting is, is there another method for collecting the information that may be more secure than the one that uh, that's used in a standard way? But that's something that could be looked into as well. So thank you, Mr. Serrata. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Hope. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, does anybody else, is anybody else with their hand up? Bart oh, Didden. Ava? Uh, Bart would like to speak. Bart Didden. No, we're not letting Bart speak tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bart. How are you? I uh, love you too, Gary. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Um, I, I want to uh, emphasize the comments that happened before me from Hope, Howie, and Tony. Almost sounds like a good Hope, Howie, and Tony. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank the uh, council for considering the comments from the last meeting and making the uh, adjustments that, uh, that you announced. I uh, haven't seen them in writing but um, I'm sure that uh, uh, Hope can uh, send those out to us, you know, uh, when, they, when they get uh, in a more formalized manner before you end up ultimately at a vote. Um, I uh, Bart, I believe that the, uh, the, revised, uh, the revised one is in the agenda package. Okay. Um, I didn't have a link for that, sorry, but that's okay. I'll find it. Um, it's on our website as well, Bart. I, I figured it is. I'll, I'll get it to you. <laughs> Thanks, Hope. You're welcome. Um, you know, and, and I like the idea of more accurate, you know, uh, from your comments earlier. Um, I just wrote down a couple of notes. I think, I think the challenge here in the proposal for uh, Ms. Klein is uh how someone's going to explain to her um how in her situation where she operates a business on her property that she doesn't have to turn over the uh receipts of her business and how uh someone needs to explain to her and everybody else who's a uh, self um an owner of how their um um, how, how their assessment is going to be calculated because obviously, um, you know, whatever internal accounting mechanisms they use is, uh, is pointless. Uh, they may have a greatly reduced um, uh, rental rate between themselves, the uh, company that owns the property and the company that owns the business. Um, they may also have it not, not my recommendation, but you know that the company that owns the property also owns the business. Um, you know, and there's a lot of tax strategies in there. So um, someone's going to need to explain um, at you know in this public hearing at some point after I'm well after I'm done how those people are going to be protected. Um, 
and then still end up with a fair um, uh, assessment, even though for tax reasons, they may be treating the revenue differently. Um, may I comment on that part? Yeah, sure. Um, you're, you're absolutely correct. And uh, uh, this actually, you know, Hope was, <clears throat> I know that Hope Klein was speaking in, in terms of a lot of her letter had a, uh, was of general application, but a property such as hers, and Denise is on is here. She can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but a a an owner operator would not have to file such an income and expense statement. For example, if uh, uh, the I think there's a misconception. This law does not apply to businesses. It applies to property. And uh, a, a person who owns a property in which their business is located and does not rent out space in that so that the property itself uh, is, is not uh, income producing would not have to file an income and expense statement. And I believe that the form would indicate that um, the property would be assessed as it, as it is always assessed by imputed rental value, et cetera. And, and the, the standard income and expense uh, would, not, would not be applicable to that. And we have many properties, especially in Port Chester that are in that, uh, that, are in that category. And I got a letter from, from one of them asking that very question. Uh, I'm not gonna name the owner, but uh, it, would not, it would not apply to that person um, and that business. So, um, Hope's car wash is substantially different than, um, for example, Mr. Soretta's uh, Solterre uh, property. Mr. Soretta may make X amount of dollars of net income from renting uh, his property to the restaurant, correct, Mr. Soretta? Um, and, and the restaurant may make a lot of money or no money but what the restaurant makes has no bearing at all on uh, what Mr. Serretta would report as long as they're paying the rent. And it would be his, the rental income that he gets minus the appropriate expenses that would be the measure of the value. Am I correct, Denise? That is correct, Gary. We okay. only look at rent to the building. Right, so. Okay, so. Uh, the and just to that matter, I just have to say that I think that if I'm confused, which is why I brought a lawyer on board to help me understand this local law number two and all of the ramifications of it. If I'm confused and I've been paying taxes for 40 years, uh, I, I definitely think other people will be confused. So this is all about transparency. Hope. Should you educate, right? That's, why, that's exactly why we're going through this. That's exactly why we're being transparent, why we're continuing the hearing, and why we enjoy hearing and listening to all of you with your ideas, and, um, and we're open to them. But okay. there are, just to uh, take your thought further about tenants and the tenants' um, gross revenue, there are leases that are written with a component that's standard or stationary and another component that mm -hmm. is directly related to how the tenant- That all has to be to, taken- To the tenant's business. That's up, that's, well, that's up to the assessor to determine basically what this is. And, and I really don't wanna get it back and forth. The public hearing uh, is to hear from the public. It's not, it's not really a discussion. I allow a little bit of leeway because I do want to be totally transparent. I want the council to be totally transparent and to get all the information necessary. Uh, yeah. But but um, the assessor the assessor's job is to look at all of these factors. And again, the the bottom line for all of this is to get an accurate valuation of the property. And yes, Mr. Ravikoff, you're absolutely correct. You have some tenants who pay a gross rent and other tenants who play, pay a triple net rent. So all of that has to be taken into account. And that's what the assessor's job is. 
So, right, but a gross rent and a triple net rent are not the concept that I'm asking to bring forward. And I recognize that you don't want to back and forth uh, before you even said it, uh, it. In all due respect, that's why I suggested perhaps you would be kind enough to go through all of the written re uh, comments and questions and address them specifically. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. Next. If I may get back on track. Um, you know, Gary, you're being very open and transparent because you don't want Miss Klein to come to your sliding glass door behind you with a sledgehammer, <laughs> you know, to equalize the conversation. Um, but uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Rabikoff, uh does bring up uh, an interesting example of uh, leases that are based on uh, gross revenues of, you know, has a component of the gross revenue of the tenant. And earlier, you know, I heard a comment from the council about how a 50% vacancy on a particular property would be an influencer uh, in the assessment. And this, this goes back to um, my comment uh, from the last meeting about once you have this data, um, because even if the data is collected by a third party that Mr. Serretta was kind of alluding to, um, it, it, still, it still has to flow into the assessor's office so that it can be considered. But uh, maybe you can uh, tell us, uh, since you're being so kind to make this sort of interactive, and I'm almost done. Uh, what kind of response rate in you know uh, in, in time does the assessor feel that we submit this information annually? Is is the assessment going to be um, reflective of a fifty percent occupancy rate in the next tax roll that gets adopted? Because now, because now you're getting down to, you know, could be really good stuff, uh, especially in this time of the pandemic. We have tenants that are uh, closing or you know uh, withholding rents, uh, not operating efficiently, um, and while others are continuing to operate unabated. So. The, the question is, is when, you know, are we going to see direct correlation of the P&L to the next tax roll period? Um, because, I mean, quite honestly, the, uh, the current processes with the bar, when a, uh, when a grievance is filed, the P&L is given nine times out of 10, I would probably venture to say is the PL is given to the bar. And, and, and honestly, the bar, I, in my opinion, is a joke because the vast majority of grievances end up in no action from the bar. So, uh, so I'm sorry I've been rambling, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for an answer uh, from either uh, the supervisor or the assessor. When is any individual year p l going to reflect in the next upcoming tax roll? Thanks, Bart. Um, I can't answer that last question. Denise would, but I don't. I don't know. I don't know that it's appropriate for her to, to comment at this point. <clears throat> I'll just say that when a p l is filed, it should be considered in the next in the next tax roll. And if there's a problem with that. Then we're going to have to uh, uh, reconsider what we do, but that's the purpose of submitting the P&L or the income and expense, whatever you choose to call it, is so that when it's submitted, it, th those numbers would be reflected the next time uh, the role is prepared. Uh, let me just make one quick comment on what you said: the the rate of submission of income and expense statements and during grievances is not ninety percent; it's more like sixty percent. Uh, and I, I, I venture to say that's one of the one of the reasons we need to 
to have this law because there are no penalties for not filing an income and expense statement at the grievance procedure uh, because um, there are no penalties except that the case gets dismissed. And that's why many of the cases do get dismissed, as you have pointed out, is because the petitioners, the commercial property owners, treat the BAR as a joke. And in fact, simply use it as a stepping stone that's necessary to get to tax cert court. So we're hoping that one of the outcomes of uh, this law will be a decrease in tax certs over <clears throat> at least after the first couple of years uh, with more accurate assessments that will have a, a um, salutary effect on the tax cert process in the town of Rye meaning the village of Porchester, village of Rybrook and Rhineck. And I'm sure Bart, you are very well aware of the tax hits that the village of Porchester takes um, in, in many tax cert proceedings that, uh, that happened heretofore. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I wanna thank you for a very substantive answer. Um, it was informative. And uh, I agree with you that a uh, grievance filed without an income and or a PL uh, should should be uh, dismissed immediately. But um, uh, maybe maybe Denise would like to uh, quickly opine no. about uh, not, not to Mark, not tonight. Not tonight. Uh, this is a, a public hearing to hear you. And I, I think that that there will be time for, for us all to digest all of the comments and to come back with um, you know appropriate responses to the questions that are raised at the pu public hearing. Well, you can't, we go, you can't blame me for trying while you've been no, hospitable. No, uh, we, <laughs> we have a limited time. We have a full agenda and this is a public hearing. So I'd like people to limit themselves. Um, who else would like to speak? And thank you, Bart. Your comments were incisive. Would anybody would else like to Anyone else comment? like to comment? That hasn't spoken? Okay, not hearing any. We will adjourn this public hearing to the November meeting. What date is that, Debbie? Or Hope, Hope what date is it? I believe it's the 17th. I believe it's the okay. 17th. All right, 17th. Mm -hmm. this, this public hearing is adjourned to the 17th of November. Thank same, you. As, as they say, same time, mm -hmm. same place. <laughs> Thank you Thank all very you. much. Thank you all for participating. Very much appreciated. Thank you for your time. Okay. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. We have a wonderful presentation. I'm going to turn <laughs> it over to, uh, to Pam Jaffe, who's uh, not only a council person, but is the chairperson of the Town of Rye Sustainability Committee for a presentation. Pam? Thank you, Gary. Nave, a quick question. Can you um, sh let me share my screen? Pam, you should be set up for everyone, I believe. Um, hostess disable participant screen share. Okay. Anyway, um, while I'm waiting for that, because, oh, thank you, Neva. Hang on. Um, okay, I think that's Neva's screen, or is that my screen? Neva, uh, the... Um, the function is right next to it, the little carrot. Uh, if you click on that, you can uh, allow uh, other participants to share their screens. Okay. Oh. Okay, I did it. Let's see. Awesome, thank you. Okay, first and <laughs> foremost, um, like Gary Thanks, said, Gary. thank you, Neva. Um, I have been chair of the sustainability committee since January. And we had some lovely meetings where the entire committee came together to kind of bring me up to speed, give me an overview of what they've done in the past. And then we went into lockdown. So then we didn't meet for six months. So we basically just picked up our meetings again in September. And I have to say between now and September, we have managed to go full gung ho. Um, first thing you're seeing is the first ever Town of Rye Sustainability logo, which, um, honestly was made by 
Sue Hoffman Designs, and I have to thank her for her creativity and playing off of our beautiful Town of Bry logo so that we stay on brand. Um, but okay, so we, had to, we took this little break. And in July or August, Debbie Reisner sends me an email. Debbie is a big follower of Governor Cuomo's newsletter. And she's like, look at this deep breath moment. This is fabulous. Can we do something like this for the town? And how can we do this for the town? And what it was, was basically um, a treasure hunt, a scavenger hunt through a park upstate where they were finding gnomes. So we wanted to give it a sustainability spin. And we wanted to make sure that we were in you know, we were really involving community members. One of the things we're trying to do is a, a committee right now is get more people involved from every aspect of the town of Fry. So luckily, um, my daughter had worked with Chloe Ng and Tess O'Brien when they founded Roots and Shoots back in their freshman year at Blindbrook High School. It's an offshoot of Jane Goodall's organization. And we went to the president and the vice president of the club and asked them if they would helm a treasure hunt in Crawford Park. And saying that, these seniors who are in the middle of college applications, and it's an arduous process, did it in three weeks. So if Chloe is still here, I'm just going to scroll down. Um, and hopefully you can see the kids hard at work here. They actually did the painting of the birds in Crawford Park. Um, and then you see some of the uh, the finished results next to them. But Chloe, do you want to talk for a little bit? Of course. Um, so I just want to say first that um, I'm really proud of the members of the Roots and Shoots Club who really stepped up and put in a lot of work and hours into planning this and making the scavenger hunt work. Um, but also we couldn't have done it without the support of the people on the sustainability committee um, and everyone who worked to help us set up the birds and print the posters and just support us as we are working on this project. Huge shout out to um, Sarah at the town office for setting up a website and all the hard work she did on you know, the back end of this project. She really pulled through for, for the students. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through a little bit of how we connected this scavenger hunt. Um, after we got the idea to have like an individual treasure hunt, we really took off with it. Um, and we wanted to connect it to our local community. So we decided to make it native bird themed. Um, so we have birds like the Eastern Bluebird and the Piping Plover, which is endangered in New York state. Um, so we wanted a way to get kids and families to become more involved in the community and also learn more about our native wildlife. So we started out by making a list of birds and doing some research on which ones were relevant and interesting. And then we designed posters um, to go along with each bird. So um, on the left of the presentation, you can see that's an example of a poster that we made. Um, the poster didn't fit, that's... so they're just little bits and pieces. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> All right. um, it, it. Yeah, it's a part of a poster that we made, um, but that's the general design. Um, we also wanted to include something that allows people to go beyond just local action. So on each of the posters, in addition to a fun fact about the bird and general information about the treasure hunt, we also put an action item, um, which was a piece of information or a resource that people could use um, to get involved in other ways. For example, one of our posters had a QR code that linked to a carbon footprint calculator. Um, another encouraged people to write to their local legislators, um, or legislators about a conservation cause that they care about. Um, and the one shown on the screen um, informs people about the, the composting drop-off program. Um, so these are just ways that people can get involved in their local community and also start reaching out to find other ways um, where they can make their lives more sustainable. Um, and it was a beautiful job, Chloe. I have to tell everyone that they made, you see 12 in the park, but they made 15 birds. Chloe's actually made some more birds because we had some bird theft, but they also created 15, uh, 13 of these great posters, designed them, printed them, um, worked with Vic and his staff to go around the park and hang the posters and the birds, which you can see are incredibly high. You know, and they ran this event soup to nuts. And then they showed it off to our local um, legislators, which is great. But anyway, back to Chloe. 
Uh, yeah, so, so far we've run um, the hunt for, I believe, two weeks, and we're planning to extend it for um, a, a few more. Um, but we've received positive feedback from some members of our community. And of course, um, we as a club have really enjoyed working on the project. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just been really nice to be able to get feedback from the community and know that people have enjoyed um, the fruits of our, our efforts and have learned something. And it's been wonderful. I mean, if you go through the park on any given day, there are people walking through, looking at the birds, reading the posters, and kind of enjoying the gorgeous fall weather in Crawford Park while taking part in this art installation. And I want to thank the Westmore News who did two articles on the project, um, really supporting the kids and getting behind their work. But I do want to say that Chloe and Gary, when they Chloe. unveiled this project, came up with another great idea. Gary remembers, I'm not sure. You did? You did. I did. You what did. You wanted well, to make something in Crawford Park more sightly. And Chloe and her advisor's ears parked, oh, uh, oh, perked yes. right up. The, uh, the, the trash bin. The, the, the giant the concrete wall. Right, the, the, the giant wall. concrete enclosure for the trash bins. Or I should say trash containers. They're not exactly bins. Yes. Yes. So that's something that we would like to discuss with Roots and Shoots once they're done with their college applications <laughs> and perhaps have like an installation in the spring if they're up for the challenge. Sounds great. That sounds great. So Chloe, did we miss anything? I don't think so. Okay. And as everyone knows, Chloe is one of our two interns for the sustainability um, committee for this year. And we also have one for next year. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Pam. Mm -hmm. Took a minute to unmute myself. We are we invite all participants to take pictures of themselves and post them, and there will be prizes. There will be prizes. Ooh. I have thousands of seed bombs in my dining room and plantable <laughs> pencils that will spring up with wild wildflowers. So the weather has been gorgeous. Um, the majority of the birds are still flying high and we do have some replacements. So while it's really nice out, we're just gonna keep it going. Um, once again, we do thank everyone in the town. We thank Sue and Sarah and Debbie and Vic and Matthew and Andrew and everyone who really came together to pull this event off in such a short amount of time. I think I made head spin, including the students. So we turn to <laughs> Um, that being said, I'm going to roll on to our next thing. We are hard at work, our next big sustainability activity, and everyone who's on this call, please do get involved. Um, we have a community cleanup going on. We were supposed to do it in April. Unfortunately, no one did anything in April. So we pulled together with all the various municipalities, and we're doing what I think is the largest collaborative effort that we've done in the town for a community cleanup. Um, we've drawn in the town of Rye, of course, the village of Ryebrook, the village of Port Chester, the city of Rye, Rynek, um, and Debbie, help me scroll through the organizations because it's huge. Uh, you mentioned the beautification committee in Port Chester? We did not. The sustainability committee in Rybrook, the mm -hmm. CACC in Rye, is that right? That's right. That's right. right. The, the it's just a sustainability committee right. in the city of Rye. And then the Rye City Sustainability Committee and mm -hmm. um, Costco actually is giving us donations. I mean, we've put feelers out to the entire community. So let me just roll to the next slide and let's show you what it is. It is going to be on November 7th, 9 to 11 a.m. at four different locations across the township. So Crawford Park is going to host an invasive weed cleanup Thick, you might need to know that. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. You had a heads um, up. <laughs> okay. Bowman Avenue, once again, um, behind Rye Ridge Plaza, is going to be the scene of Rye Brooks activity and focus. The beautification committee in the village of Port Chester are going to meet people in the parking lot of the train station and send them downtown um, yeah. to clean up by the waterfront and clean up along the streets. 
then for the first time ever, we're doing Disbro Park. And people are asked to bring their waiters. And I've never been to Disbro Park, so I'm going to have to try to figure out why people are asked to bring their waiters. But I think they're actually getting in the marshes. So good luck there. Um, afterwards, I want to thank Debbie for reaching out to the lovely people at the Barley Beach House from 11 to 1. They are going to host a party. So if you show your registration, you will have, you know, open open party time with pizza and soda and you'll get discounts off of brunchy drinks. So if you feel like you deserve a little bit more than pizza and soda, they will provide that for you. Um, if you see one of the big things we're doing with Sue Hoffman's help is putting- Pam, Pam, yes. Pam yes. can I interrupt you? <clears throat> yeah. It's an after party. I think we should mention social distancing. Yes, well, that is part and parcel. I was gonna say, if you look, um, we've incorporated QR codes so we're going as paperless as possible. It's gonna be paperless registration. And part of the registration is that everyone must bring their own masks and their own gloves for safety's sake. So that is very clear when you sign up. You cannot participate unless you've signed up, you've signed a waiver online, you come and you get, um, thank you Jeff actually for helping us with the waivers and you have to come and get it, you know, do the COVID questionnaire. And after you pass these pieces, then we send you out into the world to clean with your masks on and your gloves on. But it's it's involving a piece of tech that we haven't really used before as did the bird hunt. So the bird hunt was largely paperless too, using these QR codes that go straight to um, both the sustainability webpage and documents that Sarah created for us as far as registration. So we're trying to make it as safe as possible and as little touch contact people to people as we can do. <coughs> um, moving forward, we're not done. I mean, we have all winter to start planning things. So Vic right now is working on looking for green machines for Crawford Park. So that would be um, basically not using gas powered equipment at Crawford Park. So today Debbie was riding around on electric mower so we're looking into various ways to bring that type of technology, you know, tech technology into Crawford and then possibly into Rytown Park. Um, we've been wandering around looking at native plant gardens around the county and we've been meeting with plant engineers, like literally plant engineers, um, to see if it's possible to install gardens at Crawford. I know at the RTP meeting, I think you had a presentation on possible native plant gardens at Rytown Park. Um, building pollinator pathways, Vic and I keep talking about bees and making Crawford Park honey that, you know, could be for sale for the public um, to benefit the, the Sustainability Council. We'll see. Someone would have to, you know, tend to the bees. Gary's into a farmer's market. Our eyes goggled because that would be a great endeavor. We would love to do that at Crawford Park. And then our Bry intern, Hannah, really wants to take the treasure hunt concept to Rytown Park. So that'll be something we look forward to in the winter and into the spring. And then I invite everyone here to come tomorrow to our monthly Zoom meeting every Wednesday, um, every third Wednesday, actually, 5.30 p.m. We meet via Zoom. Tomorrow we have some guest speakers. Santosh Nandalaban from Food and Water Watch is going to come and talk about the proposed Dan Scammer plant expansion, which actually goes against Cuomo's, some of uh, Governor Cuomo's proposed energy laws that he wants to take effect by 2040 and 2050. And then the Sustainability Committee will make a um, recommendation to the council. Nancy Barr is going to come to discuss Wester Westchester County's new food scrapping program. We'll then invite members of Rybrook and Porchester to talk about their new crossover food scrapping e-waste program. And then for 30 minutes, we are gonna do some hardcore planning of the upcoming cleanup. So we are busy. Um, I love our committee. Everyone wants to get the job done and they wanna get a job, you know, get it done in a green way. So I'm looking forward to the next three years of working with this group. Pam, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Chloe, thank you very much for your participation and your work. Fantastic. And anybody who's watching this, whether you're Facebook or after the fact, please email sustainability at Town of Rye, New York. Along with our logo, we now have an email address and we'll give you information on activities and joining <laughs> the council or joining the committee.
Thank you. And that is going to bring us into the next uh, section of the meeting resolutions, starting with a resolution authorizing um, uh, the town council to retain Melissa Greco for the sustainability uh, committee on a project by project uh -huh. basis. Debbie, do you want yeah. to tell us what this is about? Yes, um, Melissa Greco is um, a resident of the city of Rye and the former uh, chair of the Rye City Sustainability Committee. And she is uh, starting a uh, professional consulting career. Uh, and um, our interests aligned and uh, she has agreed to captain our um, clearly um, multi-ring sustainability community cleanup project. She's doing a superb job and uh, with uh, the funds that are allotted in the, uh, the budget for committee support, um, we uh, would like to engage her services as needed uh, when we need uh, extra staff support on uh, projects with of the kind that of the complexity, for example, of the uh, community cleanup with lots of moving parts all going in different directions. So she's been terrific. She has been. She has been a wonder, and she works fabulously with the town staff and with all the various stakeholders in the project. She knows everybody in this community. Okay. So, sounds good. Uh, may I have a motion and a second? May I move for this one? Am I allowed? Yeah, you can move. Okay, I so move. Is I'll second. Couch? I'll second. Right. Thanks, Joe. Is there, is there any further discussion? If not, please call the roll. Hope. Councilperson Axelrod? Yes. Councilperson Jackson? Yes. Councilperson Jaffe? Yes. Councilperson Nardi? Tommy, you're muted. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and Supervisor Zuckerman? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, next item is a uh, memo, and we have James Donarelli from uh, Golf Rockfield Engineering uh, regarding the wing wall stabilization. Um, I, may I uh, make an introduction, please? Of course. Thank you. So um, all of you, I'm sure, have uh, noted that in your evening caretaker report, you've been seeing pictures of the Otter Creek wing walls. Um, the reason being that um, in 2018, we were advised that this may be an area of concern and we um, brought Dolph Rotfeld Engineering, our engineering firm in at that point, and they did a, um, a serious look at the condition of the wing walls, which uh, warranted close attention, uh, which we have been paying. Um, what has happened in the last several months is um, there have been some erosion that have been causing concern. And we received uh, advice from James and his colleagues recently that um, the, the council should take action um, sooner than later. We had been hoping uh, and preparing, frankly, to apply to the Bridge New York grant program, which is the grant program that funded the replacement of the Hillside Avenue bridge which is going on now, and I'll be briefing the council on that later. Um, unfortunately, the um, progression of uh, erosion in the wing walls have now necessitated um, some emergency action. And so I've asked James here to brief the council on what's been happening, what they propose to do about it, and how much it will cost. Hi, good evening. I know I've either met some of you or spoken to you on the phone or had some correspondence over email. It's nice to finally see everybody. Uh, my name is James Natarelli. I'm an Associate Vice President with the Dolph Rothfeld Engineering Division of AI Engineers. And as Debbie explained to you, um, I've been involved in this project having to do with the Otter Creek Bridge or the South Ferry Avenue Bridge. Um, and I'd like to share my screen and, and 
show you a little bit about the, the project and where we're going with it. Um, can I do that now? Let's see. Okay. So this is an aerial. Is this coming up for everybody? Yep. Yes. Great. So this is an aerial of the of the site. These two red lines represent the wing walls that we're talking about. There are four wing walls in total for the bridge. It's just the north side of the, the bridge where the wing walls are in question. Uh, so it's the, we're calling this the northeast and the, the northwest uh, wing walls for the, uh, for the bridge. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we are near the Otter Creek Trail. Uh, this is a shot from Street View. Uh, the, again, the, uh, the wing walls are on the, on the, in the foreground of the picture on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, right on the other side of the, uh, the, the, guard, the guardrails. Um, here are some photos. These are from uh, the 2018 report that Debbie had mentioned. Uh, the photo that you see on top, actually both of these photos are of the northeast wing wall. Uh, this is probably the, the worst of the two, uh, where you can see Rocks have started to, to slide out and accumulate at the bottom of the, the embankment. And we're having some, some material loss in the wall itself. Um, here it is again, a little bit closer up. Uh, and the bottom picture is of the, the top of the wall where you can see it start to bulge and, and it's not as straight as it once was. Um, let's see, this is the, uh, again, the top picture is the, the same wing wall and the bottom picture is the north west wing wall. So this is what we're seeing happening on both sides that the, the rocks are starting to fall out of the, of the wing wall. Um, we haven't seen any failure at the surface, which is a very good sign, um, but fortunately we think it's only a matter of time. And we need to address it now. So um, back in 2018, we had presented uh, three options to repair the wing walls or to replace them, I should say. Uh, one idea was a gravity wall, which is just large stones placed on top of each other to recreate basically what was there. Uh, that's, that's what we call the, the type of uh, wall that you see there in the pictures, it's a gravity wall. Um, the next one was a poured concrete wall. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's reinforced with steel, uh, a footing down below greed, poured concrete, and a straight flat face. Um, and then the last option we had presented was uh, interlocking concrete blocks. Um, these are very uniform looking square blocks that interlock with each other and create uh, a retaining wall system. So you may have noticed in each of these different options, we had uh, as, as part of these schematics, these, these section or details, you'll see a straight line uh, behind each of the walls. Um, and what that is, is a, a shoring system. And for any, any construction of, of any wall here, you'll have to do some sort of shoring. Um, and what that means is that uh, it stabilizes the it stabilizes the road. It supports the road because our recommendation uh, is that you keep the road open. I think you have to keep it open. Um, and in order to do that, you'll have to have some sort of shoring to, to support it. So the shoring is it's basically uh, vertical members or piles that are driven into the ground and that are then spanned with uh, lateral members or what we call lagging across from from one pile to the next. And that creates your temporary uh, stabilization uh, so that you can excavate and start to build in front of it. You build your permanent wall in front of it. So you'll see those in, in, each, of the, uh, in each of these alternatives. So where we are now is we're coming up to the winter and this is not the, the best time to, to build, to, to, to go into construction. Um, but there is, we do think <coughs> that you need to do something uh, with this site as you head into these uh, into these months, into these next coming months. So one of the things that we had considered was uh, sheet piles, steel sheet piles driven in, in these locations, just on the other side of the guardrail um, that uh, could just be, could be put in and, and could be left there through the winter until you're ready to come back and, and do the, the final uh, permanent wall. Um, when we started to kick that idea around with the a geotechnical engineer that we're working with, um, we kind of realized that that's a very disruptive or, or um, even destructive uh, method of construction right now. Um, there are utilities in that road. Uh, there's a water main and a gas main that we're, we're concerned about. We want to stay away from those, obviously. 
Um, and the vibrations of having to drive a, a large uh, sheet pile in this location could disrupt the, could undermine the bridge or these utilities. So um, that's not something that we wanna do. So an idea that we're, we're considering now is uh, driving micro piles, which are, are timber piles, picture a, a small telephone pole uh, in several locations, maybe five of them along each wing wall. Um, and excavate slowly from the, the top down in front of those on the open air side of, of these walls and install uh, lateral lagging across those, um, those piles to create the temporary stabilization to last through the winter uh, so that we can come back in the spring and, and, and put something more permanent in. Now keep in mind, this is something that, that's gonna need to be done anyway to build the wall, to rebuild the, the, uh, the new wall. Um, so we think that this is maybe a way um, to help the situation now and um, maybe get off on the right foot uh, coming in the spring um, and get started right away. Um, so the next step for us is we need a geotechnical investigation. We need to do actual borings. If you look at the, uh, the subsurface, we see what kind of soil we have there, what kind of bearing capacity that soil has, and we can really then design um, what this, this shoring system is going to look like and, and how it's going to be constructed. Um, so you may have seen, I think Debbie shared an, uh, an email with you that I'd sent to her, which was uh, an estimate for uh, some borings um, that will be done by the, the geotechnical engineers uh, subcontractor and, uh, some, um, and, the, and, and the prices associated with that work. Um, so that's, that's where we are now. And uh, as soon as we get the authorization, we're going to go ahead and, and set the geotech loose and, and he'll get the work done for us. The investigation that is. All right. I'd be able to take any questions if anybody has any questions about the project. Yeah, James, I just want to reaffirm that this, <clears throat> that whatever we do with the wing walls and or the bridge in the future, this work will not have to be repeated. This is, this would have to be done anyway. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Is the integrity of the bridge, um, you know, the, the the girders and everything, they're in good shape? They're, <laughs> they're okay. They're okay, yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 yeah, we have a, uh, we've gotten a DOT inspection report. Um, every few years, they, they inspect all the bridges. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> and yeah, and, um, and so we've already received the, the 2020 report, which I, I don't think has been made public or sent uh, around yet, um, but we've seen it and, um, it's, it's not getting better. Uh, it, it will need replacement, um, but uh, it's not, the condition of the bridge is uh, not as bad as the wing walls. The wing walls are, are what we're worried about right now. Because I know, I know the, uh, the state had yellow flagged the bridge. There were, there were element, there were components of the bridge uh, that were um, substandard, I would say. Um, but from what I understand, uh, the direction or the uh, uh, the summary that I've been given from our structural guys is that the, the real concern right now is the wing walls. Yes. Uh, and that um, if the if the town uh, wished to go for funding, that there there would probably be time to, to get the funding for the bridge, uh, and then proceed with that work. Is yeah. that bridge that bridge? I think is only like thirty years old. That's all the bridges. I think. That's what I understand as well. Yes. Uh, let me just um, <clears throat> circle back to what Debbie said. Um, when we, we, we became aware of this uh, a year or two ago, the thought was that we would go out, examine the bridge, and go out for a Bridge New York loan to... Um, it's a grant. Grant, rather, to replace or substantially repair the bridge. And that to replace or repair is a determination that the engineers would make based on whether re repair would cost 50% or more of the cost to replace. Uh, but as James alluded to, I believe, or J I don't remember James or Debbie, Debbie alluded to, the Bridge New York program has been halted because of the COVID emergency. The state's not giving out any new grant money. So the idea of waiting <clears throat> to get a, a Bridge New York grant, which funds 95% of the project, um, <clears throat> has to be put on hold 
because we are now advised that this work has to be done virtually immediately. If not today, then certainly in the spring. So that's where we are now. So, so basically, we're gonna we're gonna band-aid it for now, get it get it ready for this, and do the actual repair in the spring on the wing walls. On the wing walls, yes. Yes, with the added benefit of the, the band band-aids, we would have to put on anyway. No, and, I understand. No, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with it. Yeah, but I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. um, if we do these wing walls, say we correct these wing walls. And then later on, we want to do the bridge. Now, those wing walls all come apart, and we have to do new wing walls, new bridge, the whole nine yards. Or can we use the existing wing walls and just replace the girders and the, you know, uh, just the bridge itself? Yes, yes. The the, the second one you said. Uh, they're they're not they're part of the same overall structure, but they're not connected to each other. Okay, so then we can we can do the wing walls correctly in the spring. And then later on, when it's determined that we have to do the bridge, when we can get the grant money, then we can just do the bridge part and use the existing wing walls. Then right. The, the, the wing walls won't be tied into the bridge abutments. That's cool. Okay. All right. Um, just one other thing. We're talking about the north wing walls. The south wing walls were previously repaired uh, under uh, Joe Carvin's administration. Yes. I forgot what that's, year that's, that was. That's when it was yellow. That's when it was yellow tagged. That's when it got it yellow tagged. When, when when was that? About two thousand and eight. I know that. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. So um, they they only did the two south wing walls. Now we have to do the two north wing walls because the other side wasn't wasn't as damaged. That's why. Right, but now it is. But now it is. Yes. Okay. So all right. So that being said, Jeff, do we can can we just vote on this? Do we need to? Uh, <clears throat> there's a cost item here for borings at eight thousand and uh, the geotechnical report at forty five hundred. Is this something that we can act on tonight? Do we need to go out for three bids? Is this consulting service? Uh, should it be treated as an emergency? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man of few words. Come All on. of the above. <laughs> is it? It's an emergency. It, yes. Vote is it, Authorized. Okay. okay. Yep. Gary, Gary just to, I need to be able to run on this bridge. <laughs> Run in the center, Lindsay, not on the side. In the center, okay. <laughs> I think you should run across the creek, run down, and then, the, you know, like, have it. I think you should, I should think you, I think you should swim in the creek. It should be like a, like a, like an Iron Man competition. Yeah, like a, it's, it's like a polar plunge slash Iron Man. <laughs> what are they, right. mud, mud runs? Go in there. Yeah. <laughs> Tough mudders. Mudder. Tough mudders. Come on. All right. Gary, just to be clear, the, the numbers that I'd given to, to Debbie are uh, estimates for the geotech report and the boring. Um, we don't think they're going to be wildly differ different from that, but they may be a little bit more. So uh, I don't know if that needs to go Maybe in resolution. Maybe a little less? That's best number. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. Well, I think that you're going to have to get the... I think we can go the... We're not paying anything now. We don't have, who are you getting to do the borings? You know who you're getting to do the borings? Now, uh, I don't know the subcontractor that's going to work for the geotech. I, he may have given that to me. I'd have to look back you know, in my files. You know, I know the the, but you know the geotech. The geotech is called Down to Earth. Great. <laughs> All, All right. right. So this is not something we have to go out to bid for. We're using your geotechnical advisor. They'll, they'll contract with us? It'll be our sub. Okay. Uh, are you asking me or telling me? I'm I'm asking you which you, which you would prefer. That that's okay. If they work for us, that's okay. Jeffrey, I need a. I I need some assistance here. Okay. Did I put my two cents in? I rather have it go through him. This way, we have one contact person instead of too too many people. You know. 
This way we have one person. If we got a problem, we can go right to James. I agree with that. I agree with that. Good. Works for me. Sorry, James. <laughs> Do I get to vote in this? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like Tommy is the voice of reason. The cost, uh, can, look, we don't know what the actual cost is. At some point, we're going to get an estimate. I don't know if we're going to have it before the next meeting, but we can always act on it. Um, let's go forward. Um, do we need a formal motion to go forward on this? I'll make or, the motion. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So if we need a further, uh, if we need a further resolution down the road, then we'll do that. Okay. Right, James, thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great thank night. You, thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, uh, Debbie, while we're at it, the next item is the Hillside Avenue Bridge. That brings us to the next bridge. Yeah. Um, so, the Hillside Avenue Bridge, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is in uh, needs to be replaced. Uh, we um, at Gary's urging several years ago, applied for a Bridge New York grant together with the village and the town of Mamaroneck with which we co-own the bridge. Co-own the bridge. The, uh, the funding came through and the process began at, in, what was that, 2017, Gary? 2018? Well, we have finally arrived at a place where property acquisition is complete and filed with the county clerk's office. Um, there, uh, we had to go through a friendly condemnation of uh, the church property, the um, Emanuel Church that's on the corner of the Hillside Avenue Bridge. Um, apparently that is the only way we could um, acquire um, the very sliver of land that was required in order to replace this bridge. Um, that has been a was a, a very friendly um, procedure and that was approved in court last Friday and they're taking the final steps to pay the church and file the acquisition map with the clerk's office. Um, advertising for the bid is anticipated within two to three weeks. Um, pending final New York State Department of Transportation approval. And uh, that, that will, what will follow would be four weeks of advertising, uh, opening of the bids and award, uh, contract signing some sometime very soon after the holidays and breaking ground in the late winter, early spring. Was it, were, weren't there two more properties that we had to uh, get partial uh, yes. use of? And that Correct. one, that one yes. I mean, that Correct. one it, else had you know what, the fourth property is actually government owned, so that didn't have to be, didn't require anything. So there's two personal properties and the church property, the three. Yeah, because I know that one house, I mean, part of it, the property that they had was in the water already, if I remember correctly. Well, some, some property, yes, a part, of, part of what they owned was the, the wall and, the, and in the water. Yeah. yeah. This, so is, this, nice. is a, this is a much bigger job than the Outer Creek Bridge. This is oh, what, yeah. 3.5 million, Debbie? Approximately what yeah, they're- Yeah, approximately, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. correct. Well, we'll know when we get the bids, won't we? Yes, we, we know that process. Yeah. And, then, and, and, and we know what to follow when Bridge New York comes out again, if it ever does. We're ready. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to make sure that the, uh, that the council was apprised of the situation and uh, the assessor is, has been aware that this has been going on. And uh, I think I've, I've sent you various mentions that uh, certainly two properties will be, have, have an impact. Thanks, Debbie. Very excited yep. about this bridge. Thank you so much. Debbie, I was Debbie. born on the bridge. Well, what? not, That's no, not on the bridge, but we lived right next to it when I was born. That was quite a comment. <laughs> yeah, like your was. poor mom. <laughs> yeah, well, I, we stopped listen, at the bridge. This is an appropriate time. Um, we started this, and 
came up with the idea of of partnering with the uh, village and town of Amaranik. And the, the village of Amaranik, which has a, its own engineer um, and uh, the wherewithal more than we did to be lead agency, took it on. They've done a terrific job. And I'm glad to say I handed it off to Debbie in the town of Rye. And Debbie has been to all the meetings and has done a terrific job in shepherding this through and watching out for our interests and um, and partnering with the with the town and the village um, administrators there. And I want to thank you for, for getting all of us to this point, Debbie. You've done a great job with it. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that very much. I cannot let this conversation go any further without saying that Tom Nardi was by my side um, until uh, uh, about a year ago. So he attended every meeting and, and he was there with us the whole way. Yes, as the former highway superintendent, he knew more than anybody. And thank you, Tommy. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you. All right, um, let's move on. The, the next section belongs to Jeffrey and Denise. <clears throat> We have a series of tax cert resolutions, approvals, <laughs> and why don't we go through these one at a time, but not taking up too much time. Um, Jeffrey, are you going to handle this, or are, um, are these, these your cases or Dan's? These are Dan's. These are all Dan's. All right. Well, somebody's got to talk about them. First one is Top of the Ridge Condos. In Mamaronic. These are relatively minor reductions, actually. Yeah, this one is a 3% reduction over the period, the years 14, 15, and 16. Um, Denise, do you have any comment? No. I assume that the school district, and in this case, the village of Marinick has been fully apprised. Is that the case? That's our standard operating procedure. I'd like to set that forth for the record. Okay. Um, may I have, unless there's a further discussion, may I have a motion and a second for- I'll make the motion. Uh, I'll second. Thank you. I think we'll just do a voice vote on these. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. The next one is um, in Port Chester, 999 High Street. This is for, there are two separate lots and I don't see the percentage reduction on these cities. Again, these, these are very minor tweaks actually. If you look at them. Yeah. Reduced from 11 to 10. There's nothing major here. Um, is this the nursing home, 999 High Street? No, that's yeah. that's the apartment building, isn't it? Yes. That's the apartment building. Okay. All right, may I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, oh, th this, is, this is interesting. Getting to the dealer stations. This is the gas station on Post Road in, in Port Chester. Yeah. Oh. Years 14 through 20. A reduction um, minor, 1.3 to 1.2. Any comment? Uh, if, uh, otherwise, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. Motion. Who, who made the motion? I'll move. Okay. Oh, Jill. okay. Jill moved. Who said Pam seconded it? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 130 Aye. Midland Avenue. This is um, 
Oh, this is this is our fa our favorite one. This is the Vicaro. All right. <laughs> All right, this is a substantial reduction. The old pathway. The old yeah. pathway. Uh, vacant. That's why the, you're seeing you're seeing a substantial reduction because of the vacancy and the, the economic distress of that particular strip mall. Yeah, and that there was, was also a sale. Yeah, sale. There, there was a sale. There was a sale on this property, uh, and they paid off all their back taxes. Hmm. And the sale, I think the the sale price, I think the um, the new assessment is, I think it fairly accurately reflects the sale price. Is that correct, Denise? Yes, it is. I'm having trouble pulling up my RPS. It's not playing nice with my other programs, but yeah, that is correct. Yeah. It's based I on the sale price. Sale, I remember the sale price was around six million. Yes, and, and each year is six point two. So the end of a chapter, may I have a motion and a second? Excuse me, um, I'll make the motion. I'll second. Pam <laughs> seconds, all in favor? Aye. 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 Just, on the, just on the subject, if I may, Gary, one, one second, on the subject generally of tax certs, as they relate to possibly this new local law. So what we're hoping is that the number of tax certs get re gets reduced because we have the information on an annualized basis to keep tweaking the assessment. May re may reflect reality, and not not waiting every four or six years for a reval. That's the I whole. Know. I just I the benefit of the council member. Harking back to the other conversation, I didn't want to chime in on that, but. Um, there, there, there are several letters that allege that why are we needing this if we did a reval? Wasn't the reval accurate? Well, yes, the reval is accurate, at least we hope so. We'll know when we see the tax certs, but um, the, the, uh, this is a methodology to keep it up to date. As you, uh, as you <coughs> suggest, Jeffrey, it's um, to keep it up to date in between revals. So with that said, um, we have on here, hope, I don't see the, the resolution establishing a date for auctioning the uh, in-rim foreclosure. Right. I didn't receive a resolution. So I think we're gonna have to <laughs> pass on that one. <laughs> I didn't. Do we need a, we need a resolution? No. Why? Well, have you? Why? No, did you, uh, do you have a date for? Do you have a date for, the, for, for the auctions? No, didn't, no, not yet. Okay, well, I put that down as a placeholder, but I didn't receive the, the, the question date. That I have, the question that I have is, do we need to pass an actual resolution to set the date, or can we just set the date? We set the date and publish, no. All right. Okay. It may not well, respond either with a, with a council well, meeting that may delay well, things. Well, mm -hmm. yes. has, that, has that been the practice in the past? Because I don't recall. I don't think we ever passed a resolution setting a date for the public auctions. We just set the date for the public auctions and noticed them. Okay. That's okay. fine with me. I just want to make sure we're following the same. I was process. just asked to put it down on, on the uh, Dan asked you to placeholder. Put, Dan right. asked you to put a placeholder? Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, the last thing, last resolution is a request from Zaki's for a letter of support to the New York State Liquor Authority. Um, Zaki's wrote to me and to Mayor Falanca. The village of Portchester submitted a letter of support. Zaki's located in um, Scarsdale is moving their entire operation to Porchester. And because they're moving their operation, they need approval of the State Liquor Authority. So they're asking us for a letter of support. You have all the documentation uh, in the, um, well, actually we just have the letter. Oh, Where? Do we know the location? Is it in there? Uh, yes, it's, um, Shoot, it's on Midland Avenue. Uh, where was it before? 
Hope you remember. Um, I'm really not sure. I asked myself. I don't know where that location is. It may be somewhere near where uh, this is what I was told, but I can't say for sure. Near the uh, BMW. Yes, it's, it's, place. Uh, it's on that street. It's on Midland Avenue. Yeah, it was my understanding. It was on Midland Avenue, right, right around Strauss Paper BMW. Right. That's a strange location. Is that that's going to be retail, not warehouse? It's going to be both. Actually, it's a 70,000 70, square foot building on Midland Avenue. And uh, the idea is that it's going to be an auction house, retail, and warehouse all in one structure. And they, they run an international uh, wine auction business. Yes, I mean, I remember once upon a time I was setting up an event um, at Union Square Wines and Zachy's actually, you know, things that Union Square Wine is their competitor. So I don't think, um, you know, and they called to complain that Union Square Wine got the event, they didn't. But they don't, I don't think they would affect something like Navarmax because it is such a different level of store. So even though there's proximity there. Well, I know that there was discussion at the Porchester Board of Trustees when this came up, and some of the trustees uh, were wondering what the effect would be on on other liquor stores, and um, they 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 passed it anyway. I, I you know I, I think that uh, you know you know the mayor responded on the order of um, you know well there you know competition is good. Uh, we've had other things come in that don't put the, you know, the small business owner out of business, citing, I think, um, Home Depot. There was a fear that they would put fine sign out of business. They did not. So uh, the Porchester Board of Trustees uh, supported this. And since they asked us to, I don't see any reason not to. And um, with the approval, I don't think we need a uh, a resolution, but uh, with the, unless anyone objects, I will send a letter of support uh, to uh, to the state liquor authority uh, supporting Zachy's move. I think it's fine. I don't think there's an overlap anywhere there. It's not really a destination I'd expect for them, but actually, an overlap. Exactly, that is exactly what they think it will be. They think it's going to be a, a draw to Porchester. Yeah, that people will come from other areas. And once they're in Portchester, they'll shop here. Have dinner here. In the Midland Shopping Center. Well, um, I don't know what that's going to become. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's going to remain a shopping center or they have other plans for it. You know, also with this, with the Zaki's, it looks like they are a little higher. I mean, they, they say the average wine bottle is $52. So I think it's a little... They're high end. A little more yeah. upgraded than than the other liquor store. So I really don't think it's going to hurt them. Not that the other liquor stores don't have a premium bottle, but I think with Zaki's, they do more higher end than they do with the other stores in Portchester. Yeah. 52 bucks is a lot for a Thunderbird. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Jeff. Uh, they also mentioned employing 100 people at their location. Are they going to employ locally, do we know? Well, I'm sure they will. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, uh, the, I'm guessing that they were more than likely put out for uh, applications. Whoever, if people from Porchester put in applications, and I don't see why not. If they got the you know, qualifications, I don't see why they wouldn't hire them. I just, you know, hopefully they're not bringing the entire crew over from Scarsdale. Well, I would find that very doubtful. The there no doubt will be some people from Scarsdale, but I'm guessing that the 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 warehouse staff. Don't live in Scarsdale, and and also it sounds like they're they're upgrading. They're going to a bigger facility, so they're combining everything. So they might need extra help. Yeah, yeah. I th I think that yes, sir. from from the point of view of the town of Rye, I think this is uh, an excellent move, and that it is indeed worthy of our support. Yeah. Okay, I'm all, I'm all for it. Okay, uh, supervisor. But before we go any further. You skipped over a resolution for the uh, DJ. DJs. Oh. Huh. Well, I've done that before. Yep. Thanks, Hope. 
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for keeping an eye on me, making um, it straight and narrow. I, I'd like to suggest that we pull this resolution until next month, please. Because yeah, I, I had some questions on it. So uh, I'm more than happy, uh, or Vic is more than happy to answer your questions. But, but uh, we were planning to hold this until next month. Okay, fine. Then next okay. month, I already know my questions and I won't forget them. I'll write them down. Okay. You want to okay. let us know what they are so we can make sure we answer them? Well, the, the, my questions is, is for, for the amount of money to do basically two, uh, 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 you know, you're doing two cleanings. One, one is for heating and one for air conditioning and a uh, filter change, a uh, filter for uh, each year. I mean, filters normally, I don't think you got, I think you got to change those more than once a year. Now they're going, now I imagine they're going with those new HEPA filters. Uh, those thicker, yeah. you're Vic, you're, you're muted, Vic. Vic's muted. He's still on mute. He's still on mute, Vic. There you go. They're installing them in December. Excuse me? They're installing them in December. The HEPA filters. Now, are the blower motors going to be capable of the go through the filter? Because I know with the HEPA filters are thicker. Now, are you going to have enough CFNs to go through those uh, filters? According to them, yes. Okay. That's fine because I know with some of the newer hot, the newer furnaces, you can you can increase the speed of the CFMs. Yes. Okay. Um, but what else do we get for the amount of money that they're asking? Are we going to be getting like emergency calls as part of the emergency calls if we have a problem? I mean, they're coming up, they're coming down from Marlboro. Okay, so that's that's part of what we'll answer you next month. Yeah. Okay. So we have, we have a little bit more homework done. That. You know, I have a question. They did a fantastic job. The job is beautiful. I have no, no complaints about the job they did, but for the amount of money that they're giving, I've got questions about what their service contract because it's too vague. Because for that amount of money, for what they're put, what's in here for this resolution, to me, it's not enough. Tom, I agree with you. It should be explained more. It should yeah, be more detailed. Did we get a, Excuse me. Did we get any other bids on this? That's why we're going for next month. Okay. Because I know we all, I think all of us on this call own homes, and I know that I call my HVAC guy in the winter, and in the and in the spring for service, and it doesn't cost me anything like thirteen thousand no. dollars. But I also mean, it measured Vic, in the hundreds. Vic, they also Maybe. did the wet. They did the hydronic end too, right? Not just yeah. the air. They they did yeah. both. They did it all. Yeah, because you've got a hydronic system, so you've got you've got circular, you've got pumps, you've got you know, there's a lot that can go wrong, and it, it, they really got to they really got to iron out their contract what they're covering because that's way too vague. All right, so I, I accept, I accept it's more complicated than what's in my house and yours. Yeah. Is that correct, Tommy? Okay. Yes. But I still don't see the thirteen thousand, so no. we have to justify that. Yes. Okay. Thanks, thanks for the early peek uh, at uh, what we need to be ready for, Tom. Yeah. I mean, like I said, they did a beautiful job. The job is it's second to none, but I have questions with uh, the amount of money we're paying you know, that they're asking for what they're what we have here. So I, I'd like to see that more in detail, what they're going to cover. That's fine, Tom. I agree with you. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We're up to reports uh, since it is getting late. Uh, do we have anybody that wishes to give an oral report? The assessor? I'm good for tonight, Gary, but thanks. Okay. Camille? <laughs> I can just tell you very quickly that um, we are looking at probably a little over 300 events for the year, by the end of the year, with... Um, probably a net revenue of a little over $20,000. So all things considered, um, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, we continue to be very busy outside and um, doesn't seem to be slowing down. People are still happy coming to Crawford and using all of our facilities. Excellent. I, I wanna make sure that the uh, council know that we have a Cub Scout overnight yes. this weekend. Yes, we do. On the 24th, this Saturday, we have pack number three uh, from the Rybrook Cub Scouts. They are doing a family sleepover and camp out. Um, so they will be at Crawford from two o'clock on Saturday till 
10 a.m. on Sunday. Each family will have a tent. There are 18 families. And uh, they're going to have their own little fire pit, which we have gotten everybody's uh, comfort level where it needs to be. Um, and should be should be a fun night for them. So we'll see. I just hope but they're very fun. happy. They're very appreciative, and uh, I think they're they're going to have a fun time. Great, sounds wonderful. I just hope they have good weather. So yeah. far, it looks good. Yeah, so far it looks good. It'll I'm, be dry. I've done a lot of camping yeah. in the rain, and it's <laughs> <laughs> harsh. No, good luck to them. Have fun. Yeah. Great. All right, Nick, you have anything for us? No, report submitted, unless you have questions for me. No, I'm good. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Nick, collections are coming in from the schools? Yes, they are. We sent notices, sent over 500 notices out there. So if you haven't paid your school tax, please do so as quickly as possible. As I put in the, in the notice, comes November, it becomes a 5% penalty. So please take a serious look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick should do that at Yankee Stadium. He's got that echo. <laughs> <laughs> now batting. <laughs> that, always, that always brings me back to the Lou Gehrig ceremony. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, I submitted the, my report. <laughs> Oh, maybe, uh, I don't know. If oh, Jeff I didn't get, to. okay, we'll skip to you. You submitted your report, Hope. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Davey, do you have anything for us? No, I submitted my report as well. So not, no, major, no major change in September. Okay, it's thank you. Um, I think that's it. Have I missed anything now? No? No. Nope. Then we're, may we're I have not. a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion. I'll second. I'll Thank second, you. but I'll ask everyone watching to go out and vote. Two weeks. Not not only that, not just to go out and vote, but on the 11th is also Veterans Day. So thank you for your service. Yes, indeed. Yes. That's right. It's coming up. Yes. Bless our troops. He, Bless those who've served. One thing on that, um, we may be able to get the barbershop group again to do haircuts for veterans and seniors oh. in the pavilion. Oh, I, mm, very know, nice. That's Great. a good thing, but I, I'm going to pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. See Aye. you next month. See you guys good tomorrow. Night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.